Good morning YouTube, this is Peter Rody speaking and today I'd like to tell you about boson sampling which has become a really hot topic in uh, optical quantum computing lately. I've published about nine or ten papers on this recently and there are new papers coming out every week. So in this talk I want to give you an introduction to what boson sampling is, why it's interesting and hopefully you'll walk away uh, understanding why this is an exciting area of research at the moment. As a prerequisite for this talk I'm going to assume that you have a very elementary understanding of optical quantum computing, uh, quantum mechanics and quantum optics. But even if you don't have a background in these things you should still be able to grasp most of what I'm talking about. So I'd like to begin by presenting you with a challenge, an open question, and that is how long do you think it will be before you can build an optical quantum computer that can outperform any existing classical computer? And if you were to do this, what would be the physical resource requirements to build a device like that? And how much will our technology have to improve to do this? And if I asked you that question, you'd probably pull out this paper, a very famous paper by Miller, Flum and Milburn, where they showed for the first time that linear optics with photo detection and single photon sources is sufficient for universal quantum computing. And you would read that paper and you would come back to me and say, well, Peter, according to this paper, if we want to build a post-classical algorithm like Shaw's algorithm, we're going to need billions of optical elements, millions of single photon sources. Peter, forget about it. This is decades away at the very least. And you could be forgiven for completely giving up hope in the future of optical quantum computing. And this begs the question, is there an easier way to do things? And the answer is yes, and that's exactly what boson sampling is. So recently two guys from MIT, Scott Aronson and Alex Arkhipov, they presented an alternate model for optical quantum computing, which is now called boson sampling. And in this model, you need single photon sources, passive linear optics networks, and photo detection. That's all you need. You do not need quantum memory or fast feed forward, which is a big distinction from normal optical quantum computing protocols. And despite being much simpler, it is still implements a classically hard algorithm. And to beat the classical limit, we might only need tens of photons and hundreds of optical elements as opposed to millions or maybe billions of them. So this is a massively simplified model for optical quantum computing. Here's an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Now, Scott Aronson and Alex Arkhipov are computer scientists, and they present their results in the context of computational complexity theory. So they give very complex uh, complexity theory results. And I'm not really smart enough to reproduce those results. I don't understand them very well because I'm not a computer scientist. So I'm not going to go through their formal complexity proofs. Instead what I'll do is I'll summarize the results that might be interesting to physicists, especially the experimentalists. So I'll focus on the physical results rather than the computer science results. And I'll give you a summary of all the recent developments in the field, both theoretical and experimental. Here's a summary of the model. The first thing we do is we prepare a multi-photon input state. So just a bunch of single photon number states or FOX states and some vacuum states. We then have a passive linear optics network which does not contain feed forward or quantum memory and we evolve that, that multi-photon state through the passive linear optics network. Now unlike other models for quantum computation, in the boson sampling model there is no concept of qubits or qubit gates. You're all familiar with what a qubit is. You've encountered gates like CNOC gates and Pauli gates. None of that exists in the boson sampling model. So, so get your head away from the idea of qubits. And then after evolving our multi-photon state through the passive linear optics network, we perform photo detection and just sample what the photon number distribution at the output is. And we repeat this many, many times over and the goal of the problem is to sample the photon number statistics at the output to the highest degree of accuracy that you can through repeating the experiment over and over again. And I'll emphasize that this model is not believed to be universal for quantum computing. So we can't solve BQP complete problems. KLM can, this can't. So it implements a subset of quantum computing, but that subset is still a computationally hard problem. Here's how the model looks diagrammatically. We have some single photon states in N modes, some vacuum states in the remaining of the M modes. We propagate them through a linear optics network that implements a unitary map on the photon creation operators like this. And then at the output, we've got some big superposition of all of the different ways that the photons could arrive at the output. So in this notation, S represents a configuration of where the photons could arrive. 
uh, for example, S could be 10 photons in the first mode, 2 in the second mode, none in the third mode, and so on. Gamma S is the amplitude associated with this configuration, and N sub 1 superscript S is the number of photons in the first mode associated with configuration S. So this output state here represents all of the possible configurations, and then we do a photo co coincidence measurement, and we sample from this probability distribution P of S, which is the absolute square of the amplitudes, and our goal is to build up statistics of what P of S looks like. Now it turns out that we don't even need uh, uh, photon number resolving detection to do this, because in the model proposed by Scott and Alex, the number of vacuum modes scales on the order of the square of the number of single photon modes, which means that if we go to a large system with lots of photons, most of the modes are vacuum modes, which means that the output was statistically almost guaranteed to never have more than one photon in a given mode. So this is the binary regime where every mode has either zero or one photons and it's very unlikely that it has more than one photon. So what are called bucket detectors is sufficient. Bucket detectors is just an on-off detector. You either have photons or you don't and the number doesn't matter. So this is another simplification compared to KLM for example where you need photon number resolving uh, detectors. So this implements what's called a sampling problem. It's not a decision problem. Most of the algorithms that you're familiar with, like Shaw's algorithm, are decision problems where you ask a well-defined question and you get a well-defined answer. This is not a decision problem. It doesn't give you the answer to a question. It's called a sampling problem because we have statistics at the output and the goal is to calculate what the statistics are. Here's a quick summary of the proofs. Now, over here on the right, is a summary of the logic used by Scott and Alex to prove the boson sampling is hard. Now I don't have the first idea what most of this means, so I'll suffice to say that they postulate that boson sampling is a classically inefficient algorithm using these complexity results over here. And specifically what they show is that boson sampling can only be efficiently classically simulated if the polynomial hierarchy collapses. The polynomial hierarchy is a concept in computer science that's kind of similar to P and NP. It's a generalization of those complexity classes. And so the statement, does the polynomial hierarchy collapse, is kind of a similar sort of statement to, is P equal to NP? Now, no one's proven that the polynomial hierarchy does or doesn't collapse, but we're pretty sure that it doesn't because it's been studied for years and there's no reason to think that it does. Um, so, so for that reason, we're pretty sure that boson sampling is a hard problem. Uh, I'll say that a boson sampling computer can be simulated by a universal quantum computer, but the reverse, as I said before, is extremely unlikely. And another big problem with boson sampling is that unlike algorithms like Shaw's algorithm, there's no known efficient witness for boson sampling. So not only can a classical computer not simulate boson sampling, but it can't even verify if a boson sampling device operated correctly. So if I give you the statistics, for what I measured at the output of my boson sampling device and I say tell me whether that's correct or not we don't have a good understanding of how you can verify that it was correct so that's a big uh, conceptual problem which I hope we can overcome in the future now I'd like to talk about the relationship between boson sampling and matrix permanence because this gets to the crux of why boson sampling is a computationally hard problem so one of the key results is that the probability of measuring a given configuration is proportional to the absolute square of the permanent of a matrix where the matrix is a function of the unitary describing the linear optics network and the output configuration. So every amplitude or every probability is proportional to a different matrix permanent but every, different, every, different, every matrix is different for, for a given configuration. Now it was shown that calculating complex valued permanence is sharp p complete and sharp p complete is a class in the in the hierarchy of complexity classes that's even higher than np so we're pretty sure that this is a class that cannot be efficiently classically simulated so the amplitudes in our boson sampling system cannot be efficiently classically simulated now i will make a comment now and that is that boson sampling does not let us calculate matrix permanence. I've seen this mistake made in a few papers and I've had to correct a few people in the past. Boson sampling does not let us calculate matrix permanence. The reason is 
that we've got this output superposition with an exponential number of terms in it, and every amplitude is proportional to a different matrix permanent. If we wanted to calculate a matrix permanent, we'd have to know a particular amplitude with a high degree of precision. To do that would require an exponential number of measurements, because there are an exponential number of terms in the superposition. So for this reason, uh, we cannot use boson sampling to efficiently calculate matrix permanents. So to use Einstein's sort of terminology, God conspires against us. God knows how to solve these sharp P complete problems, but he's very clever and cunning about it and encodes them in a way such that we can't figure out the answers to them. So boson sampling does not let us solve sharp P complete problems. Rather, it's a sampling problem which is a function of a set of many different sharp P complete problems. Let me show you in a bit more detail how this relation with the permanence arises. Up here I've got an interferometer drawn, and I'm imagining that we've got two photons at the input, one photon at the first mode and one photon at the second mode. And let's say that we want to calculate the amplitude of measuring a photon in the second mode and a photon in the third mode at the output. Well, there are two ways that that could happen. Either the first photon, go photon goes through to the second mode, or the second photon goes through to the third mode, or vice versa. So they either swap or they go straight through. So you can write out the total amplitude of going from 1 and 2 to 2 and 3 as the amplitude that they swap or the amplitude that they don't swap. For each of those, it's given by the product of the two amplitudes, and then we sum up the different paths. It's a bit like summing up Feynman paths. Now this sum here can be represented as this matrix permanent here. That's analytically the same thing. And what you find is that in general, if you have an interferometer with n photons at the input, in general, these amplitudes are proportional to n by n matrix permanents. So if you've got 10 photons in your system, the amplitudes are proportional to 10 by 10 matrix permanents. And the best known algorithm for calculating matrix permanents scales exponentially with n. Here's a simple example to illustrate the point. This was the Hongo Mandel dip, which anyone in quantum optics is familiar with. The idea is that you put two photons into the inputs of a 50 50 beam splitter. One photon in the top mode, one photon in the bottom mode. We use a balanced beam splitter matrix, so this is the Hadamard matrix. And at the output, what we find is that we have a superposition of both photons in the first mode or both photons in the second mode. We never measure one photon in the top and one photon in the bottom. So there's a suppression of the coincidence events. And the reason the coincidence events are suppressed is because the permanent of this beam splitter matrix is equal to zero. This submatrix corresponds to the uh, coincidence terms, and that permanent goes to zero, which is why the coincidence terms vanish. So why is boson sampling hard? Uh, well, the full proof is very complex. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a 100-page long paper, so I'm not going to give you the computer science result. Instead, I'll give you s three intuitive reasons why we might intuitively expect boson sampling to be a hard problem. The first intuitive reason is that there are an exponential number of terms in the output superposition, which means that we can't explicitly calculate the full state vector on a classical computer. But that's not sufficient. Uh, there are, in fact, many quantum systems that have exponentially large Hilbert spaces that are still classically easy to simulate. Some classic examples are tensor networks. Anyone familiar with this knows that tensor networks can be efficiently classically simulated, but they have exponentially large Hilbert spaces. Another good example is the Gottesman Mill theorem, which tells us that a quantum circuit consisting only of Clifford gates can be efficiently classically simulated, despite the fact that they have an exponentially large Hilbert space. So one is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. The second intuitive reason is that the amplitude of each term in our output superposition is related to a sharp p-complete problem, which means we can't classically calculate the amplitudes. And the third reason is that the state is highly entangled, which means that we can't sample each mode independently to work out the statistics. If there was no entanglement, we could just sample every mode independently, take the product of all of those probabilities, and work out the joint uh, coincidence probabilities. But we can't do that because it's entangled. So jointly, these three reasons give us a pretty good uh, reason to believe that this is a hard problem. But as I said, the full proof is much more elaborate than that. Here are some open questions or problems in the field. The first one is fault tolerance. Is fault tolerance possible? Now, any quantum system is subject to decoherence. Uh, that's just an inevitable fact in quantum mechanics. And in normal quantum computing architectures, 
uh, we have fault tolerance techniques, error correction mechanisms that allow us to overcome uh, decoherence in a system. So the question is, is something like this possible in the boson sampling? Uh, to me, I think this is highly questionable. In fact, I think it's unlikely because uh, boson sampling is not universal. Specifically, it's a completely passive system. By definition, it's passive, which means that there's no way of sucking entropy out of the system. Remember that removing decoherence from a system is projecting it from a mixed state down onto a pure state. So you're sucking entropy out of the system. But we can't do that because, by definition, it's a passive system. So if any kind of fault tolerance is possible in the future, it's going to have to rely on developing completely new techniques for fault tolerance because our existing understanding based on uh, sucking entropy out of the system is, is not going to be uh, consistent with the boson sampling passive only model. The second open question is are there any algorithms which can be mapped to boson sampling because presently none are known. For normal quantum computers we have plenty of algorithms. There's Shaw's algorithm for factoring large numbers, there's Grover's algorithm for searching databases, there are heaps of other algorithms and graph theory and all sorts of mathematical problems, simulating quantum systems. At the moment, for boson sampling, no one has described a single useful example application for what we can actually do with boson sampling. So to me, these are the two biggest open questions. Now I'd like to move on to some recent results in the field and give you a summary of where things are at at the moment. The first thing I'd like to talk about is the robustness of boson sampling. Um, as I said before, any system is subject to errors, so what about boson sampling? There were some recent results by myself and some of my collaborators where we showed that boson sampling might still be implementing a classically hard algorithm even if there are substantial loss rates in the system or even if the photons have low purity or low pairwise fidelity. Uh, we haven't actually proved this. We've presented some evidence based on some intuitive arguments. So it's not a formal complexity proof. But we do provide some evidence uh, that, that under these conditions, boson sampling remains a computationally hard problem. And this is much more favorable than KLM or other LOQC protocols, if it's true. And it's still an open question whether it actually is true. The next thing we can do with boson sampling is secure quantum computing. Specifically, there's a type of encryption called homomorphic encryption, which lets uh, two parties uh, process data on each other's computers without the other party learning what the data is. So suppose Alice and Bob are, are our two parties. Alice has data, and Bob has a computer and an algorithm. And Alice wants to process her data on Bob's computer, but Alice doesn't want Bob to know what her data is, either before or after it's computed. This problem is called homomorphic encryption, and it turns out that it's very easy to do it in the boson sampling model. The first thing we do, the first step, is that uh, we say, let's imagine that the configuration of where the vacuum and single photon terms are at the inputs, we'll call that our, our input state, our data. That's, that's the data that Alice wants to keep secret, where the photons are at the input. What we do is we replace every vacuum mode with a single photon in the horizontal polarization basis and every single photon term with a single photon in the vertically polarized basis. So now every single mode has a photon with either horizontal or vertical polarization. Now keep in mind that photons with orthogonal polarization do not interfere. So if we pass this state through the interferometer, the H's don't interfere with the V's and so these two components uh, interfere separately independently of one another. The second thing uh, that Alice does is she chooses a private key, which is an angle. And Alice applies this random polarization rotation according to that angle to all of the photons using a matrix like this. And then she sends it to Bob. And so what Bob has is this polarization mixed state. He has no idea what Alice's data is because he doesn't know what polarization basis to measure it in. So if he tries to measure it, he'll measure rubbish. Bob, pa Bob passes it through his boson sampling device and sends it back to Alice and then Alice applies the reverse rotation, throws away the horizontally polarized photons and keeps the vertically polarized photons which encode the output to the computation. So using this mechanism, Alice can process her data on Bob's computer using a boson sampling device and Bob cannot know uh, Alice's data either before or after the computation has taken place. Another uh, thing that's been talked about a lot in the literature lately is 
the question of whether boson sampling can say anything about the extended church Turing thesis. So firstly, let me tell you what the extended church Turing thesis is. The church Turing thesis says that any physically realizable system can be simulated using a Turing machine. A Turing machine is just a classical computer. The extended church Turing thesis says any physically realizable system can be efficiently simulated using a Turing machine, whereby efficiently we mean with polynomial overhead. Now most computer scientists and physicists believe that the church Turing thesis is correct. Nobody has found an example of a physical system that cannot be simulated on a Turing machine. But most computer scientists and physicists believe that the extended church Turing thesis is incorrect. Uh, and the main reason why we believe this is because of quantum mechanics. We know that there are lots of quantum systems which, to the best of our knowledge, cannot be efficiently simulated on a classical computer. So a big open question is, can we prove that the extended church Turing thesis is incorrect? And there's a claim that's been made by many authors lately, and that is that experimental demonstration of boson sampling would either provide evidence against or even disprove the extended church Turing thesis because it's an example of a physically realizable system that cannot be efficiently simulated on a Turing machine. So it seems to be a fairly reasonable claim that boson sampling could disprove the ECT thesis. But I have a problem with this and I'd like to show you why that is exactly. The reason is uh, because of error models. Every quantum system is subject to some kind of errors. So let's consider a simple independent error model in our boson sampling device. We have n photons. We're going to replace every photon with either a single photon with probability p or with probability 1 minus p, some erroneous term. This erroneous term could refer to a variety of different things. It could be uh, non-single photon number terms or it could be photons in the wrong spectral or temporal basis, mode mismatch, whatever. So with uh, probability p, our single photon is the desired single photon. With probability 1 minus p, it's some rubbish that's an error. Now, Aronson and Arkhipov show, or in their, in their original proof of boson sampling, that boson sampling is computationally hard if the error rate is bounded by, by an inverse polynomial in the size of the system. So in other words, if we have a boson sampling device and the samples are corrupted by some erroneous rubbish, the probability of sampling from the correct distribution has to scale as at least one on poly n and if we want the boson sampling device to still be implementing a hard problem. But looking at this equation here, you can see that the probability that we have sampled from the correct distribution is little p to the power of n. That's the probability that all of our single photons were actually single photons, little p to the power of n. So we require that little p to the power of n uh, be bigger than one on poly n. And in the limit of large n, that's clearly not the case. Exponential beats polynomial for, for large n. So what this means is that the hardness of boson sampling breaks down for large systems if we introduce an independent error model like this. But the ECT thesis is by definition an asymptotic statement. It only applies in the limit of asymptotically large systems. So if boson sampling breaks down experimentally because of error models, then you, by definition, cannot make any asymptotic claims about it. Let me give you a simple example uh, as, a, as a bit of a comparison. Lots of people don't realize this, but you can prove on pen and paper that an analog classical computer can efficiently solve NP-complete problems. Most people don't know that, and lots of people probably wouldn't believe it, but you can prove this. So you might think that that would provide evidence that P is equal to NP because you've got a classical system that can solve NP-complete problems. Surely that proves that P equals NP. It doesn't. Why not? The reason is that as soon as you introduce a physically realistic error model into an analog classical computer, it breaks down and it can't solve NP-complete problems anymore. And so for exactly the same reasons, boson sampling breaks down when you introduce a physically realistic error model. And so for the same reason that P is not equal to NP because of analog computing, I don't think that the ECT thesis can be disproven using boson sampling. Okay, so let's now talk about how to build these things. The first thing we need to do is make a linear optics network. And there's a really famous result by Reck and Zarlinger where they show that an arbitrary m by m unitary can be decomposed into the order of m squared optical elements 
and the decomposition can be found in polynomial time. So if I give you a unitary U and say build it, the first thing you can do is you can efficiently figure out a decomposition for it. The second thing you can do is you can efficiently construct the decomposition, which means that using, for example, discrete optical elements like beam splitters and phase shifters, we can always build a device like this. Using waveguides, we can always build a device like this. In some recent uh, work by my own group, we showed that a fiber loop ar architecture can build an arbitrary unitary network. So we've got some photons coming in in the pulse train separated by some time per pulse. They go through this double fiber loop architecture and then they come out at the end and you've implemented an arbitrary unitary. So there are lots of ways of building these uh, unitary networks. The next thing we need to do is have photon sources. Now there are many different ways that you can make single photons but the one that's the most readily available to us today is spontaneous parametric down conversion. And, um, and uh, this is widely used in almost every experiment to date. Uh, and the way it works is that you have a, a nonlinear non crystal and you pump it with a, with a laser light. And then with some probability P, it spits out a photon pair, one photon in each of two modes. And what you do is you detect a photon in one arm. And if you successfully detect a photon, then because of the correlation, you're pretty sure that you've got a photon in the other arm. So using a bank of SPDC sources like this, you could build a universal boson sampling device like this. You have your SPDC sources, you measure one arm of each SPDC source. Whichever ones click, you know that you've got photons in the corresponding other arm for each source. You then put them through a multiplexer to route all of the photons up to the first end modes of the unitary and you implement your boson sampling. Hey presto. And we proved in recent uh, paper that this uh, kind of architecture is scalable, so, so it works in the, in the large limit. But it's hard because this multiplexing part is quite challenging. We know how to build U, we know how to build the SPDC sources, but this multiplexer, that's a killer. So what, what can we do about that? Well, there was some recent work by Austin Lund and his collaborators where they introduced what's called scattershot boson sampling, where they showed that, in fact, you can get rid of the multiplexer. So you just have the SPDC sources, you detect the one arm in each source, and then the other arms get rooted straight into the unitary without the multiplexer. And they showed that without the multiplexer, it still implements a computationally hard problem. And the reason, in a nutshell, is that uh, without the multiplexer, uh, input state is always some permutation of where the photons could have arrived. The permutation is known by where the heralding arms clicked. And so we're still sampling over, a, randomly sampling over a, a set of matrix permanents where the matrix, matrices are known. So this is a big experimental simplification. This multiplexer is the hardest part, and now we can get rid of it altogether. Uh, a logical question to ask is, is there anything special about single photon states? Boson sampling is defined in terms of Fox states or number states. Are there any other classes of optical states that also give us computationally hard sampling problems? Uh, the answer is yes, there are. In some recent work that I've done with my collaborators, we showed that two classes of states probably give hard sampling problems. The first is called a photon added coherent state. This is where you mix a single photon state and a coherent state on a beam splitter and at the output you get a coherent state with an extra photon added to it. We showed that this is a provably hard problem if you in, do, do a sampling problem with it. And the other class of states we consider are cat states which is superpositions of coherent states. They're called cat states because if the coherent states are large then you've got a macroscopic superposition of states which is what a cat state is. So we showed that that type of uh, input state also probably gives a computationally hard sampling problem. So it's probably the case that there's actually an enormous class of optical states that give computationally hard sampling problems. I briefly want to go on a bit of a di divergent topic now and talk about quantum walks. This is a topic that's received a lot of attention lately. Um, a quantum walk is where you have a graph, the vertices represent places where a walker or such as a photon can be, and the edges between vertices represent allowed transitions. Quantum walk is just the quantum generalization of a classical random walk. And in some recent work I did, I showed that any quantum walk on an arbitrary graph can be decomposed into a linear optics network, and any linear optics network can be decomposed into a quantum walk on some choice of graph, which means that multi-walker quantum walks are actually isomorphic to boson sampling if you choose the graph structure appropriately.
So all of these people who are doing experiments on quantum walks, finally they have something useful to do with their quantum walk, and that is that the application is boson sampling. It's by definition the same thing. Now I'd like to have a look at some of the recent experiments that have been done. Here are some experiments showing how you can build the unitary network that does the interference. On the left we've got two experiments using discrete elements, on the right is an integrated waveguide device. So both of these were quantum walk experiments, but as I said, it's the same thing. Uh, he, both of these are a quantum walk on a linear graph structure. This is also a quantum walk on a linear graph structure. We put in photons into one of three input modes. There's a section in the middle where they interfere, and then they get fanned out, and we can do coincidence measurements at the output. This experiment was done with two photons. Both of these experiments were done with one photon. Let's have a look at that two photon experiment in a little bit more detail. This was done by Alberto Peruso in Bristol using waveguides and two photons. So imagine that we put in a photon here and a photon here. The way to characterize the output state to the system is by doing coincidence measurements. So we know the coincidence probabilities of all combinations of where the photons could have arrived. And to characterize that we do a coincidence matrix which is a two-dimensional matrix. One axis is the position of the first photon, the other axis is the position of the second photon, and then in between we've got all the probabilities associated with those joint coincidence events. And what you'll see is that this matrix is not separable. It cannot be expressed as a function on one axis times a function on the other axis, which is a signature for entanglement. So we know that we've got a high level of entanglement in this system. Now if we increase this to three photons, this would become a three-dimensional matrix and with four photons, a four-dimensional matrix. So you can see very easily that as we increase the number of photons, the complexity of characterizing these systems grows exponentially, which is uh, what we anticipate for a computationally complex problem. So that experiment was done with two photons. Since then, there have been four experiments using three, uh, using three photons. Uh, this diagram here is from the paper by Matthew Broom at the University of Queensland. So they use a double pass of a SPDC source to produce three photons. One of them is heralded, the other three are used in the experiment. They are fed in, go through some polarizers and waveguides and stuff, and then they go into this central on-chip region where they interfere with one another, then they get fanned out, and we do coincidence measurement of the output again. So that, that same experiment was done independently by four different groups, and they all got the same results. These systems are sufficiently small that we can efficiently verify the system by explicitly calculating the matrix permanence on a classical computer and comparing them to the statistics we get at the output. But if we were to scale this up to 10 or 20 photons, that would no longer be an option, and we'd run into this problem that I mentioned before, and that is that how on earth do we actually verify this system? So in conclusion, boson sampling is a highly simplified model for optical quantum computing. It's entirely passive, there's no feed-forward or quantum memory or any hard stuff like that, no multiplexing, and simple demonstrations are within reach. It might be robust against loss, mode mismatch, photon distinguishability, spectral impurity, but that's not proven. One thing is for certain, that is that homomorphic encryption is dead easy. Uh, Multi-walker optical quantum walks and boson sampling are the same thing, uh, but unfortunately this boson sampling model is not universal for quantum computing and we do not have an application for it as yet, other than simply to prove the point that we can build something that's post-classical. But for that reason, I think this is the direction that LOQC needs to go in the future. KLM is probably decades away. Boson sampling could be just around the corner. So let me finish by answering my own initial question. I asked you at the beginning, how far do we need to go before we have a post-classical optical quantum computer? Well, the back of the envelope calculation will tell you that a boson sampler with about 20 photons and a few hundred optical modes would require storing about 7 times 10 to the 33 parameters uh, in, your, in your classical computer if you were to explicitly simulate the state vector. And that's already beyond the memory abilities of the best classical computers. So this is perhaps a benchmark for the threshold we need to cross if we want to claim that we're in a post-classical regime. 20 photons is still very challenging but it's a hell of a lot easier than the millions or billions that we might require if we wanted to build a KLM type quantum computer. So thanks for listening. All the papers that I cited in this talk are available for free at archive.org. And if you have any questions about this talk, please find this talk on my blog, peterrody.org. Post your questions there.
and I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks very much for listening.